I grew up in Logan, Utah, which is high in the Rocky Mountains, altitude nearly, uh, uh, nearly 2,000 meters. We had deep snow when I was growing up. And so obviously, before I was eight years old, I wanted to be a driver of a snowplow because you could push the snow to such great heights. But then when I was eight, my mother took me to a lecture about astronomy, about the solar system. And I became very excited about the idea of the solar system. So she did some projects with me about astronomy. And I started doing reading on my own. Decided I wanted to be an astronomer. But then when I was 13, I found in the big city, Salt Lake City, a great big city of about 100,000 at the time, I found a little paperback book called One, Two, Three, Infinity by a physicist cosmologist named George Gamow. And it described ideas from mathematics and theoretical physics and cosmology that I found even more exciting than astronomy. And so at age 13, I decided I wanted to be a physicist, but I would work on things connected to astronomy. And so here I am. The most enjoyable part of science is doing it. Uh, it's sometimes very hard, sometimes very frustrating, but extremely rewarding when you suddenly understand something. It's an adrenaline rush when you suddenly understand something. It doesn't matter very much whether somebody else has understood it first or not. It's, it's nice if you're the first person, but, but just to suddenly understand a puzzle that you've been struggling with uh, for a long time is just fabulous. And it is remarkable that uh, we as humans are capable of understanding the physical world around us uh, in such detail that we can predict things that turn out to be true, that we can uh, understand things that are very far from Earth, such as the black holes that we have discovered colliding with gravitational waves, uh, and uh, that we can use the understanding we develop of the physical laws for technology, for human benefit. And uh, so that aspect of it also is really quite wonderful. The power of science for understanding and for technology. But personally, the joy of discovery is uh, the, the big deal. Imagination and creativity are really very crucial for, particularly for the big leaps of understanding. But they are far from enough because you may have imagination and creativity and th suddenly think you understand something far beyond the frontiers of current knowledge, but you will usually be wrong. And uh, you validate this through experiment. And you validate it also by seeing how it fits into the well-established laws of nature uh, and how it fits logically into this complex structure of all the well-established laws of nature. And so you really, in order to validate the insights, you have to use these two additional things, experiment and detailed mathematical analysis. There are a number of people that have influenced me in how I think and work as a physicist. John Wheeler, who was my PhD mentor and was a tremendous inspiration. We had very different views about the political world, but uh, we uh, were very much of the same mind about how you understand nature, and I learned so much from him. He was a professor at Princeton. Also at Princeton was Robert Dickey, who was a superb experimental physicist who was a mentor to Ray Weiss, my colleague on the LICO project. And I was there uh, studying about black holes with John Wheeler and gravitational waves, and also participating in the research group meetings of Robert Dickey. And I was learning about how experimental physics is done through Robert Dickey and his research group and Ray Weiss. So they, those two were among the a handful of people who profoundly influenced me.
well, among the Nobel laureates, my colleagues that, uh, with whom I am receiving this prize, you know, we actually, Barry Barish and Ray Weiss and I, are icons for a very large experimental team of a, a thousand people in LIGO. Um, and that team is so superb, but uh, the people that really have inspired me working with them are Weiss and Barish and Ronald Drever, who uh, is no longer with us, has passed away, uh, whom I've worked with intensely on this. Also, uh, Robbie Vogt, who was the first director of LIGO and did, helped us in the first step in the transition from a, a set of ideas uh, into the real world of what LIGO is today. Let me describe my own personal, my personality. I'm a person who likes to work on science quietly by myself or with one or two students, maybe a postdoctoral student. I'm introverted. I behave like an extrovert. I learned how to do that, but uh, I'm fundamentally an introvert. And I get the greatest pleasure from that kind of work. Uh, but LIGO could only be done as a big collaboration. There was no other way to do it. And so I gritted my teeth and I plunged into this and helped in every way that I possibly could to uh, lay foundations for LIGO and then uh, to help Barry Barish, uh, wherever he needed any help from me, grow LIGO from a small uh, experimental project that it began with, with Ronald Drever at Caltech and, and Ray Weiss at MIT, this small collaboration into what it is today. It could only be done as a big collaboration. It is so difficult. The things that go wrong are such a huge number of different things. It requires large numbers of experts and variety of different pieces of physics and engineering to pull it off. And uh, LIGO is the triumph of a thousand people, the superb experimental team. And uh, I think my biggest contribution was to understand where they had to go because I'm a theorist and I, and I knew about how strong the waves were. I understand how they interact with the detector. I understood what needed to be done. There's no way I could do any of that. Uh, but I could also convey to the funding agencies uh, and the science community uh, my faith in the experimental team. And I could explain why I had faith in the experimental team. And, so I, that, that was probably my biggest contribution was, was to convince funding agency and physicists that this should go forward. Um, it's a strange kind of a role, but, uh, but I, I think without that role, it would probably not have happened. For a project of this sort, the only way it could be done was through a governmental agency. It was a project that uh, cost uh, un, up until now about $1.1 $1 .1 billion. It's a lot of money, not as much as some of the very biggest uh, physics projects, but uh, by far, the, the, I think, the largest thing that the National Science Foundation in the US has ever done. It was absolutely crucial. Um, and uh, so this really was a collaboration initially between Caltech led by Ronald Drever and me, MIT led by Rainer Weiss, and the National Science Foundation, where the key person was Richard Isaacson, who was our program director, who himself had made an enormous breakthrough in the theory of gravitational waves. It solved a problem that had puzzled uh, everybody from Einstein on uh, for decades. Uh, how is energy carried by gravitational waves? This was Isaacson, who turned into a government funding agent. And he understood how things worked in Washington. He understood what we were doing because he is such a superb physicist himself. And it was, he was really the, uh, the additional person that pulled this off. And without NSF and Isaacson, this would never, never have happened. You need to work on a breakthrough problem with whatever kind of team is optimal. And in many areas of physics, a very small team is optimal. That's true particularly in condensed matter physics. 
Uh, it was true on this year's Chemistry Nobel Prize, uh, which was done by physicists. Uh, it uh, is true in uh, last year's Physics Nobel Prize. And so I would say the majority of breakthrough work can still be done in small teams, but there are certain things, and gravitational waves is one that can only be done in a big collaboration. We in the physics community have learned, I think, how to function side by side as colleagues uh, with some people working in huge teams like LIGO with 1,000 people and others who are working in the manner that I prefer to work myself in a very small effort with just uh, one or two or three professors and a small number of students and postdoctoral students. And uh, both are needed depending on the problem. My mentoring has been one of my greatest joys. Uh, I am proud that I have mentored 50 something, 50, I don't know, 52 or 54, I don't even know the number, PhD students uh, during my career. And that they have gone in a huge number of different directions because I mentored them broadly so that they uh, had the tools to be able to work in anything from uh, uh, an analyst at the CIA on one extreme, to very uh, abstract theoretical physics on another extreme, uh, in the computer industry, uh, in management. I had a student who, uh, two students who moved into the financial world very, very successfully, uh, and they look back and they say far more useful to them than Harvard Business School, which was a key piece for what they wanted to do, was doing a theoretical physics PhD uh, under me. Because in doing a theoretical physics PhD, they learned how to take a complex problem, break it down into pieces that could be solved, how to, for, how to transform a problem into a soluble form. And that gen general skill that is the essence of success in physics is transferable to all these different areas of human enterprise. So I, yes, I'm proud of my mentoring and I've gained, taken, taken great joy in it. Oh, I have several favorite bits of advice. Uh, one that I gave particularly to my granddaughter who is a physics uh, uh, PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University now. Uh, I, I told her, when she said she wanted to be a physicist, I said, uh, physics is a great springboard from which you can move in many directions, so fine, but you have to find a direction that you absolutely love. Because if you're going to spend a large portion of your life on something, it has to be something you love. Yes, it also should be something that's important, something that can help the world, but you have to love it. And, and this is advice that I got from my own grandfather when I was about four or five years old. He told me, Kip, uh, if uh, you will succeed in life, if you find a job that is like play. And so that's one thing. You have to be willing to, ready to, eager to work very, very hard. It does not come easily. And so that's a sec second piece of crucial advice. A uh, third piece of advice is you find your own way of functioning. Uh, I, my mind is much slower than most of my colleagues' minds. And I discovered that when I was an undergraduate. And uh, I struggled for the first year and a half as an undergraduate at Caltech, where I spent most of my subsequent career. Uh, but I developed my own ways of learning things, of keeping records of what I was learning, working things out in my own way in notebooks and so forth, that enabled me to uh, achieve despite having a slow working mind. And so, so I advise students, you find your own way and you have to experiment of mastering material uh, and your own directions that you can be successful in. And everybody is different and uh, we can all succeed in different ways. Almost everything that I have done was something I never planned to do. That was true of LIGO. Uh, gravitational waves, 
uh, I've watched through my entire career, my, life, my lifetime, particularly as an adult, for opportunities, unexpected opportunities, and that is basically what, what uh, gravitational waves were. I came along at just the right time to do this uh, together with uh, uh, Barish and Weiss. Uh, and uh, I jumped on the opportunity once I saw that it uh, had a real possibility to succeed. Similarly, I never intended to be involved in movies, uh, but I was single in Southern California uh, for about nine years, and I dated in Hollywood. And, uh, and one of the people that I dated was a woman named Linda Opes. She uh, was a movie producer, just had just arrived in Hollywood at, at the time that I was single. And uh, so our romance never went anywhere uh, because perhaps I was too much of a nerd for her and uh, she was perhaps too intense for me. But we became very close friends and she's a close friend with my wife, Carol Lee, as well today. And uh, so many years later, Linda telephoned me and she said, would you like to brainstorm with me for a movie? And I thought for a very short time and said, yes. Guys, I could see immediately, one, it would be fun. I would be working with brilliant people who are very different from me, and that's particularly fun. And I would have a possibility to, uh, to convey through a Hollywood movie the beauties and power of science to an audience of, well, what turned out to be about 100 million people who bought tickets to this movie. Uh, and how else can a professor reach 100 million people? So, so I said yes. And, uh, and so, we brainstormed, we created the ideas for a movie. She brought Christopher Nolan and John, Jonathan Nolan on board to write, the, to write the screenplay, direct it. They completely changed our story, but kept all the science that we had put into the uh, movie in there. And so it turned out to be a wonderful collaboration between me and these filmmakers about a movie in which the movie is really based on and uh, steeped in the real science. Yeah, pop popular culture has tremendous potential for uh, inspiring people about real science. I don't know how effective we can be about educating people about real science. Uh, uh, Interstellar was not an education process, it was more of an inspiration process with the so I wrote a book to go along with a movie called The Science of Interstellar, which is my attempt to provide education in addition. But I think popular culture can provide tremendous inspiration about science and can convey some of the ethos of science, but uh, hard to convey the basic ideas with any precision, obviously. Well, I think uh, my two favorite films that were necessarily scientific were the uh, two that preceded mine that were also had the science built into them from the beginning. 2001, A Space Odyssey, where uh, a physicist, Arthur C. Clarke, provided the underpinnings for it. It was Stanley Kubrick's film. And then uh, the uh, movie Contact, where a Carl, which was a collaboration between Carl Sagan and Linda Opes, the same woman that I collaborated with to make to make Interstellar, is the beginning of that that film. It was Carl Sagan's film, and in both cases, again, the science was embedded so deeply it was inextricably interwoven with the film, and I I have loved that. in small ways, but not major ways. Um, so in Interstellar, I worked very closely with a visual effects team, a computer graphics people at the company Double Negative, uh, where the lead person is, uh, is Paul Franklin, who got the Academy Award for the visual effects in Interstellar. Uh, and in order to make the uh, beautiful images of the black hole gas around the black hole, uh, swirling gas around the black hole, the wormhole in that film. It was necessary to create a whole new way of going from a computer simulation to uh, visuals on a screen. And, and so uh, the, uh, 
Oliver James, who was the chief scientist at Double Negative, and I worked out this new method to do it, which was uh, necessary because you could not get the high resolution uh, smooth images that were required for this science fiction movie in any other way. But the methods that we devised are now being used by astrophysicists uh, as part of their visualization of simulations they do of, uh, of, of things like black holes and accretion disks around black holes and neutron stars, colliding neutron stars and so forth. So there's a feedback in that sense. Uh, but I think beyond that, the uh, key, the direction of the feeding is largely from the science into the film and through that uh, to popular culture. So, you know, my current career at the Interface with Arts, at the Arts, which is not just movies, it's uh, music with Hans Zimmer and visual effects, uh, multimedia concerts. It is uh, a book I'm working on of my poetry and paintings by a superb young painter. My new career is, is my hobby in some sense. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy these interfaces with, with the arts. Uh, but also, my wife and I uh, just enjoy each other, and we, ha we have a wonderful time. We, uh, in very extreme moderation, we don't have that much time for it, but, but we hike, we scuba dive, uh, we ski, but not very much in the last few years. The last few years have just been too hectic. The kind of work that I do, and whether it's working on a movie, searching for ideas for a movie or in physics, you co I collect information, problems, issues that I'm struggling with during the day, day after day, and I may be struggling with some issue, some f issue of how do you depict something in a movie, or uh, how do you solve a particular physics problem. I'm, may collect all this information related to it during the day for a few days. Then in the middle of the night, the inspiration comes. Somehow things connect together in the middle of the night. I get up, go in the bathroom and write notes and go back to bed. And usually the notes are fairly coherent and often they have a key idea that I couldn't get in any other way. My mind has to go more or less blank and things have to just somehow naturally start fitting themselves together in, in a semi-conscious state. And that's where the inspirations come. Gravitational waves are a tool to explore what I like to call the warped side of the universe. These are objects and phenomena. They're not made from matter, like you and I and people watching this video but instead are made from warped space and warped time. A black hole is the prime example. A black hole uh, is made from warped space. The uh, diameter of a black hole is huge compared to the circumference, whereas normally the circumference is bigger. Time slows to a halt near the surface of a black hole. You see this in an interstellar, where Cooper's daughter, Murph, Cooper being Matthew McConaughey, Murph being uh, Jessica Chastain. Uh, daughter Murph ages uh, from age 11 to 95, uh, while Cooper ages hardly at all uh, because Cooper goes near a black hole and where time slows. So near a black hole, time slows down. Inside a black hole, time flows in a direction you would have thought was a space direction toward the center, but that's the direction time flows. Black hole drags space into whirling motion, uh, like the Aaron or tornado. So black hole is made from warped space and time. And uh, colliding black holes create a veritable storm in the fabric of space and time. There are other phenomena on the warped side of the universe. The birth of the universe itself, the earliest moments of the universe, space and time tremendously warped. Uh, things called cosmic strings, where the circumference around this sort of rubber band-like object is less uh, than pi times the diameter. It, and these weird things that are made from warp space and time are a wonderful topic for a book about the warp side of the universe. And so this book is a collaboration between Leah Halloran, who's a 
young painter and photographer uh, who is good enough to have sold pieces to the Guggenheim Museum in New York, though so she's in her 30s. And so it's her paintings of these phenomena, of the storm in the fabric of space and time that produces gravitational waves, cosmic strings that produce gravitational waves. So her paintings and my poetry about it. And uh, so I've never shown anybody except my wife, hardly any of my poetry, my attempts at poetry. If uh, my poetry is so bad that it, it makes the book, uh, this book uh, be a total loser and doesn't sell but two copies, one to her and one to me, well, that's all right. I've had success elsewhere. And, and if I drag her down, that's all right. She's had success elsewhere. So we're having fun doing something that's different for us. And uh, it, uh, perhaps people will enjoy it. I enjoy the process very much of working with creative people who are very different than I am and trying to do something different from what, what I've done before. Right now, the harder thing uh, for me, writing poems is a lot harder than doing physics because it's new, but that's why I'm doing it. I've done physics for most of my life. I've been doing physics uh, in a serious sort of a way for more than half a century. And so let's do something different. Uh, that is also very hard because I'm very new at it. So that's the challenge and that's the joy.